Good morning, everybody. My name is Bob McIsaac. I work at Acelity. I'd really like to take the opportunity to thank you for, for joining us this morning um, for our session. Our session today is going to be how are you managing your diabetic foot ulcers, an innovative approach, an innovative and a, an approach and therapy in accelerating wound healing. Uh, I'd like to personally thank Miriam Boutros and Wounds Canada for providing us the form uh, to communicate our message to you today. To facilitate today's session, we have two guest speakers who I'm going to introduce to you um, in very short order. What I'm really going to do today is encourage you to lean in, really lean in and listen to the message that our speakers are providing to you. Take in the information and internalize it. They will share wonderful um, information with you. You'll also see um, these on your chair, um, they're postcards. Have a look at them. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to win something very valuable to you, I'm certain. Uh, it's to win um, registration to next year's conference, which would be a draw. Uh, complete this. You have two opportunities to uh, drop by the booth on, um, on Friday evening and on Saturday. Complete it and, um, and we'll do the draw on Monday. We'll communicate it to you via social media. Everybody got them? Yeah? Cool. Thanks. So let me tell you a little bit about our speakers. Dr. Chris Murphy is a registered nurse and enterostomal therapist with Canadian Nurses Association certification. Chris studied tissue viability with professional practice at undergraduate level, followed by the Masters of Clinical Science in Wound Healing from the Western University. Her doctoral research investigated the assessment and treatment of lower extremity wounds in the vascular surgery population with focus on ultrasound debridement, protease activity, and wound infection. Chris's professional activities include President-elect of the Canadian Association of Enterostomal Therapy, co-chair of the Communications Committee of the Canadian Society of Vascular Nurses, adjunct professor at the Masters in Clinical Science of Wound Healing Program at DU, panel member of the 2013 RNAO Best Practice Guideline Update, uh, Diabetic Foot Ulcers, and current co-chair of the RNAO Best Practice Guideline Update on Ostomy. She's also a manuscript reviewer for several peer-reviewed journals. What does she do in her regular job? Uh, Chris leads a vascular limb salvage project uh, at the Ottawa Hospital with focus on innovative wound solutions for a challenging population. This incorporates research, clinical practice, and education while seeking new perspectives on understanding of infection ischemic complications through data analysis of outcomes. So please welcome Chris. <laughs> Second speaker is Dr. Ken Unger, clinical lecturer, section of pedi podiatric uh, surgery, Department of Surgery, Peter Lougheed Center, uh, University of Calgary, Cummings School of Medicine in Calgary, Alberta. Ken Unger has been practicing podiatric medicine and surgery since 2001. He obtained his BSc in biochemistry at the University of British Columbia, followed by podiatry training at WM School College of Podiatric Medicine in Chicago. He completed his residency program training at St. Francis Hospital in Hartford, Connecticut in 2001. He subsequently set up a practice in Calgary, Alberta, where he has worked with the section of podiatric surgery since. His areas of interest and expertise are reconstructive surgery of the foot and ankle, wound care and limb preservation in patients with diabetes. As an active participant in the Diabetes Limb Salvage Preservation Clinic since its inception, he has a significant background in conservative and surgical management of foot-related diabetes complications. So please join me in welcoming Ken Unger. And then, Chris, over to you. Okay. All right, let's figure this out. Okay, so we're going to talk about proteases. So when you think about proteases, perplexing, confusing, relevant, interesting, do they affect your outcomes? Do you think about them when you do your assessments? 
It's an interesting topic to talk about at dinner parties to impress your friends and colleagues, make you look like the wound expert. What we're going to do is give an overview, quick overview today of what proteases are, describe the effect on chronic wounds, and wound strategies so that you're up to date and uh, able to have those conversations. So why does this matter? Well, I think most of us in this room know why it matters. We're spending way too much money on chronic wound care. Cost of diabetic foot ulcers is now more expensive than each of the five most expensive cancers, and we're spending millions of dollars on low extremity wound care. And how much of this money is being spent on wounds that are stalled, not going anywhere? not moving forward, just doing the same thing day in, day out, without getting those, those outcomes. And why might that be? The protease problem, you remember, may remember a few years back, MMPs with all the rage, well, they still are important. We may have sometimes forgotten a little bit about them. But we know that 90% of chronic wounds with elevated protease activity won't heal they'll be stuck. This is one of the reasons that your wounds are stuck. And we know that only about 1% of wounds are treated for this. So I'm not sure if you're treating your wounds for this or if you're thinking about this as you assess your wounds. Something to consider. Remember what is the goal. When we think about looking at that wound, we want to heal that wound. We want to be picture number two, right? We want that closed wound. What we're actually doing, though, is trying to support the tissue to reconstruct. So picture number one is a blue cell hanging in a green extracellular matrix with the collagen fibers and the little pink bits of what looks like a plasticine-type um, compound that is the glue that sort of helps stick and attract things together. We have to have all these components together and working, and then as a viable tissue communicating and so forth. We're building a three-dimensional structure with all of those components functioning and being in place. In normal wound healing, this happens through a sequence of events. We have the clotting at first when there's the wounding initially, and then we have inflammation, which is a transient response to get all the cells where they need to be to line things up, get those growth factors moving and so forth. Then we have proliferation, new blood vessel growth, cell division and collagen deposition, etc. And then we have resolution. Very simple, one after the other sequence of events. So our goal then is to regenerate these functioning cells that are dear to this um, extracellular matrix and close the defect. But things go wrong, right? We have, as we say, these um, sequence of events that occur, but what we see with chronic wounds is they get stuck in the inflammatory phase. And inflammation in a poor host can happen from poor tissue that then sort of dies or doesn't progress and is a source of protease and also the bacteria invasion, which is also a source of proteases because bacteria use those proteases, their own proteases, to invade the host. And so we have this cycle. We have this increased inflammatory response from poor tissue and bacterial invasion. The cells then produce more proteases. You get degradation of the extracellular matrix, which is supposed to hold the tissue together and be that foundational scaffold, and then you get more proteases, more bacterial toxins, and so forth, and the cycle just goes on and on and on, and you don't actually progress the wound forward. And remember, protease is something that will take apart all kinds of protein bonds, and our tissue is its flesh, right? It is protein. Protease activity, of course, is is necessary in normal wound healing. You need that initially to clear out the environment and then it should resolve very quickly and your wound heals. In chronic wounds, that elevated level just goes on and on and on and on and on and your wound doesn't heal. And proteases and an imbalance is, um, they're implicated in many forms of disease. So when we think of things like cancers, um, 
cancer metastases, um, things like aneurysm. So protease imbalance is uh, the inflammation in a lot of diseases. We know in wounds, in various different wound types, that we have several different types of proteases that are the problem. They're the MMPs, the matrix metalloproteases, which are, require zinc or a metal, that's why that name, um, to function. And we know that eight, nine, two, certain ones have been um, reported to be the ones that really, really impact wound healing and really highly destructive. MMP9 being the one that gets a lot of the press. And then human neutrophil elastase, so those neutrophils that release that elastase is another one. And that degrades the fibrin actin, so it's sort of the glue and the attracting um, sort of plasticine stuff we saw, it degrades that so that the, the collagen and the scaffold doesn't hold together properly. And then, of course, eating up the um, growth factors. So if you put both of these families of prote proteases together, you really can destroy pretty much everything you're trying to heal. So how do you know when you look at a wound that there is um, an elevated protease activity problem? Well, things stall, right? You can start thinking of a chronic wound at maybe four weeks, but you may think of a compromised host even earlier than that when things aren't moving forward. And sometimes you know those patients that aren't going to move forward, right? You know who those people will be. You'll see poor quality granulation tissue. Things just aren't looking like they're getting someplace. And you may see some increased drainage with inflammation. You often get a little bit of increased drainage. And whenever you see increased drainage, you might want to think, well, you know, I don't just need to put in more absorbent dressing, but why am I seeing this? How do I switch off the tap? And proteases may be one reason. So what might you see? You might see this cliff edge that's not moving forward, right? I'm sure you've seen that when you've looked at wounds. There may be a rolled edge appearance. So we know that impaired cell migration and poor new blood vessel growth is one of the things that we see with an imbalance of MMPs. So how can addressing help? So how does some of the products help? Sorry for the pictures so early in the morning, but we're a wound bunch. I think we don't really care about that, right? Um, we can rebalance moisture, right? That's very critical to let those cells move the way they should. pH balance is pretty critical, too. Do bacteria like high pH or low pH? Bacteria like a high pH, right? That's their preferred environment. So managing pH is one of the areas of research now to see if we can get that environment a little bit better. Think of the acid mantle of the skin as a protective way, so lower pH will help healing. To reduce, of course, the inflammatory proteases and to stimulate the positive wound response by giving the components for building that scaffold and stimulating the wound environment to move forward. So in particular, what does ORC collagen do in particular? It has three main components. So there's the native collagen, which is the intact collagen, and this is what you need for the structure of your extracellular matrix. And you need healthy collagen. You need collagen with healthy receptor sites where cells can actually hook on to them if they're not good receptor sites, your cells can't attach. So this provides good, healthy collagen. That collagen also sequesters MMPs. It acts as a decoy. So those MMPs will munch on this rather than the collagen in the wound. So that's another way that it works. It also contains denatured or broken collagen. And broken collagen is your body's signal that something's wrong. When you cut yourself, you break the collagen, that is one of the big signals to say, send in the troops for healing. So it contains broken collagen to recruit the troops for healing. And then the ORC piece, which is important too. It's known to bind the elastates and the metal ions, which are part of what is necessary for MMPs to function and binds free radicals, and it also uh, reduces the pH. 
It is bioabsorbable, so it's nice and easy to use. You don't have to uh, pull it out. Patients like that. So the cellulose piece, just talking just a little bit more about the cellulose piece. Cellulose is very, very abundant, right? It's, it comes from wood pulp and cotton. I don't know if people know that. Interesting fact. And the oxygen, oxidization process makes it bioabsorbable. So when you put it in, you go back, it's disappeared, right? And we, we warn patients of that because sometimes they think, oh, nobody put it in. But also it's a hemostat that stops bleeding. And I don't know if you've ever used it for that, but we actually use it quite often for that purpose. And in my own practice, we'll use it sometimes under a, a vac when it's oozy at beginning post-abridement. Put it on a continuous suction. It provides a pressure point, a hemostatic, and then it dissolves, and then the vac can take over when the bleeding stops. So we use that. Again, that's my own practice. That's not necessarily a cell saying that, but we use that quite uh, extensively in the post-op period, in the recovery room, and so on. The lowering of pH, of course, reduces the uh, bacterial environment, the bacterial-friendly environment. And uh, we know from in vitro studies that it increases cell growth and protects growth factors from degradation. And those growth factors are necessary to coordinate the uh, environment for healing. When you put together the ORC and the collagen in the 45-55% uh, ratio, we get a 100% reduction in elastase, which is critically important too. So we're really improving that wound environment now for healing, that stalled wound that won't heal. We also know that it's effective against bacterial proteases. And remember, bacteria use proteases to harm their host. That's one of the key ways they invade the host. So uh, that is very critical in some of our wounds that have this sort of grumbling along, high bio burden. Clinical evidence is there. There are 12 RCTs in various different wound types that show that collagen ORC improves healing seven of which are in diabetic foot ulcers. So in summary, to balance your wound environment will support your success with healing. And when you think about how long some people are on service not healing and how many products and how much money is being spent on those wounds, it's a good idea to consider proteases and think, is that part of the problem? and see what you might do about addressing them and seeing if your results change. Consider those elevated proteases and think early. Don't wait till it's late further on because the earlier you get on top of this, the better it will be. And of course, the least expensive wound is a closed wound. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm Ken Unger um, from Calgary, Alberta. Uh, pleasure to be here with you this morning. Just get my slides to come up here. There we go. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about diabetic foot wounds and some of the things that we're doing in Calgary. Um, I work with the division of podiatric surgery there. Uh, we've got a small group of guys, uh, five of us now, one of our uh, key members has just left and gone to Montana. Um, and we're staffing our diabetic foot and wound clinic um, and uh, having a little bit of uh, fun and some adventures with that while it grows and seeing some good things happening. A few statistics, Canadian Diabetes Association 2015 has come out with a few of these statistics. I'm sure you've all seen them. 3.4 million Canadians with type 1 or 2 diabetes, 9.3% uh, of the population, and expected to grow to 12.1% of the population by 2025. Just a very large uh, segment of our population being affected by this disease. Diabetic foot complications, uh, ulceration, are a major medical, social, and economic cost worldwide uh, and studies have approximated that 15 to 25 percent of people with diabetes will have an ulcer of their foot during their lifetime. 
Uh, I've seen different numbers, 6 to 8 percent prevalence, uh, but this is the statistic that Diabetes Canada has latched onto from Armstrong just a few years ago. This is something that people don't really know. After amputation, the five-year mortality after a single leg baloney amputation is worse than colon cancer, it's worse than Hodgkin's disease, it's worse than breast cancer, it's worse than prostate cancer. Um, it's a devastating uh, treatment for a devastating disease and if we can nip these things in the bud, stop them um, with a smaller amputation, uh, get the wound healed before it ever becomes a thought of an amputation, we can do a lot of good for people. Etiology of ulceration, um, number one, peripheral neuropathy. The patients just simply don't feel what's happening. Uh, I had a woman uh, just a very short time ago, they called me to the emergency room, they said, we don't know what's happening, we've seen her for three weeks now, we've been giving her antibiotics. I walked in and I saw her feet and I said to her, what kind of pet do you have? Because it looked like somebody had been gnawing on her feet. I've seen that when I trained in Chicago, I had a guy who went to sleep on a sofa one Sunday afternoon uh, with neuropathic wounds, toe infections, and while he slept, his dog Otto or amputated his feet for him. Um, he woke up and his dog was licking his chops and he didn't have any toes left. Uh, so I thought, okay, here's the etiology of this person's ulceration. Uh, but she didn't have any pets. So I picked up her shoe and she had this nice little ballet loafer, which was completely inappropriate for her. And I said, well, let's look at the shoe. And as I turned it up to look at it, out came a key ring with four keys on it and a metal bottle opener. And her eyes just lit right up. She was thrilled. She said, I lost those four weeks ago. You found my keys. Unfortunately, I had to trade her one toe for every key that I gave her back. It just her toes were beyond salvage at that point. So identifying the, the cause is, is key and neuropathy is powerful. Patients just have no idea what's going on with their foot. Structural changes, uh, bunions, hammer toes, uh, shark foot all play a role in increasing pressure in certain areas. Ankle equinus, tightness of the gastrocnemius muscle, will forcibly plantar flex the foot, increasing forefoot pressures. Uh, gastrocnemius recession and Achilles tendon lengthenings are procedures that I do not infrequently to decrease this deformity and help to prevent recurrence of ulcerations. Soft tissue trauma, either repetitive stress and the calluses uh, that you see, single event trauma, we see that very often, and sometimes even some toenail disorders will, will cause damage to the skin that can precipitate these wounds. And finally, peripheral vascular disease affects most of these patients as well. Not all, but most. So tenants of wound healing, number one, you need good vascular supply. Number two, you have to remove all devitalized tissue, anything that's necrotic. That's the home for bacteria. Um, it's got to go. Infection has to be treated adequately. Uh, and then you need appropriate offloading and protection. Um, we've heard just how important uh, from Chris here how maintenance of a healthy wound bed is as well. Uh, and I've added that as, as a fifth tenant because it's becoming more and more apparent that we just need to have that in addition. So if your patient has a wound, the steps that should be taken, none. Um, recognize that most wounds are caused by pressure, thus the cause must be mitigated in order to reduce and resolve the issue. This is difficult. Um, I see in my community that patients with diabetic foot wounds are told to, you're, here's a bandage, you're, we're going to see you every week and just do regular life. I don't believe that they can do regular life. I think patients need to be offloaded. The other thing that I do is orthopedic trauma and foot reconstruction. I keep those people off their feet. They need to be off their feet while those bones heal and those tendons heal. So I don't understand the dichotomy or the, the mindset that says that these patients need to be off and these patients don't need to be off. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I'm a little bit strict with my patients. It is difficult. Uh, granted, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. Uh, I've done about 10,000 foot and ankle surgeries now, and I've walked that many patients through it, and it's doable. It's no fun. I've been there myself, but it's not impossible. Um, and when patients say to me, hey, I can't do this for three weeks, the alternative is a baloney amputation, and that's for life. And you just have to, you have to really put it in that framework. 
Um, so I'm not a big fan of walking casts and healing sandals. I kind of throw those in the same category as unicorns and leprechauns. Um, to me, they're, they're myths. Uh, I see a lot of things that just have been treated with a healing sandal and patients feel, hey, this is going to do it for me. And it's just not. So crutches, knee scooters, and wheelchairs. I met this guy two weeks ago. He's been wearing healing sandals for over a year. Um, in my professional opinion, they're not working. <laughs> so just to recap, um, we have damage to the tissue. We have cytokines and free radicals released in the tissues. We get proteases working. Uh, when these uh, extracellular um, modulators become out of balance, we get more damage to the tissue. We add a little bit more weight bearing, we get a little more damage, we introduce some bacteria and toxins a little bit more, and we just get in this cycle of a wound that is, is burdened and delayed and stalled. So how do we rebalance? Number one, we reduce that microbial burden in the biofilms. Number two, we lower protease activity. We stop uh, chewing up some of the things that actually help us. Um, we get rid of that from a host and a bacterial perspective. And then we maintain a moist wound environment. This gets a wound that starts moving into an optimal balance and we can start to see some healing. So what have I been doing lately? I've been using Promogram and Promogram Prisma. Um, this is the ORC collagen matrix with silver added. Um, I've been primarily using Prisma and I've got a few cases that uh, I wanted to share with you today. Uh, before I do that, uh, Gautrop et al. published a study not too long ago about Promogram Prisma. Um, they included two arms, just a standard control arm and a Prisma arm. They found that after four weeks, 50% of wound healing was their benchmark. 43% of the wounds healed to 50% with their standard of care control, as opposed to 79% with Promogram Prisma, nearly double. Also remarkable, wounds withdrawn over 12 weeks, 31% in the control arm, and none in the Prisma arm. So you get nearly twice the amount of healing demonstrated by this study and no patients removed from the study due to infection. Um, these are both things that are important to me when I'm treating these patients. So this is my first patient. Uh, he's an engineer, smart guy, um, had a toe amputation because of septic joint, um, walked all over it, dehissed the wound, got it infected. I saw him a week after and I had to take the toe, uh, leaving him with a, a ray amp and, and a void of tissue. Our options at this point were to do a transmetatarsal amputation to get primary closure and go right across the forefoot or try and do some local wound care. We opted for a little bit of local wound care. Um, I used a vac initially. We've got a pretty good looking wound here. Um, the infection is controlled, but very, very uh, poor offloading with this patient. Just could not connect those synapses with him. Um, so I used a SNAP system, which I'll get to you, uh, or I'll talk about a little bit later, and a split thickness skin graft we tried on that wound because it looked ready for it. Unfortunately, he was walking on it very significantly. The SNAP failed, the skin graft was torn away. You have a little bit of take there up at the superior aspect of the wound, uh, but it's not, you know, it's not that impressive and it kind of stalled and, and just sat here. So I said, what am I going to do with this? I decided to use some Promogram Prisma. And uh, I'm not sure if you can appreciate it, but just to the dorsal aspect of the wound, there's a fissure that's full thickness and it goes all the way up to, to essentially where you can see it. And down in the plantar shadow is another deep fissure, full thickness. Uh, so this, this medial flap there is a little bit raised and a little bit loose. So we applied Promogram Prisma. Um, you can see I've kind of tucked it in, all those little crevasses and all those fissures. Two weeks later, there's a significant reduction in wound area, but more impressive to me was how this wound had bridged in these fissured areas. You know that that's probably, if you deal with these wounds, probably some of the hardest stuff to get to heal. You'll get a, wheel, uh, a wound to close down from a circle to a fissure and then it can just take forever. But 
the patient has also bought into some offloading now and he's using a knee scooter. So we're not getting those shearing forces of weight bearing through this wound. Uh, and the combination here, I think the scaffolding of Prisma uh, really helped those cells in an in a accelerated way to bridge those gaps and you just see the wound closing down. Three weeks later, we're here. The wound is about, um, well, it's, it's gone from about 250 square millimeters to, to less than 40, really. A very significant. The patient's now buying in fully to non-weight bearing. Um, he gets it now. And at six weeks, we're fully closed. This patient came to me um, earlier this spring. 62-year-old, insulin-dependent diabetic. Uh, she had a little brush against a ceramic heater. Uh, it looked like a little more than a brush to me. Um, she was seeing her diabetes educator in my clinic and uh, she pulled me over and said, you want to maybe have a look at this. She had a third degree and in some areas fourth degree wound. This was right down to capsule uh, in that toe. Uh, full thickness skin loss. This is one week post injury that I'm seeing her. Um, you can see a pretty mucky looking wound, some necrotic stuff, some maceration. It was infected and her family dog had started antibiotics three days previously. So we're starting to see a little bit of, of resolution of some of that severe cellulitis, but you can still see that it's not looking entirely healthy. Uh, she had good strong palpable pulses, uh, so I didn't have to do any vascular testing for her and we got right down to some debridement and Promogram Prisma was my dressing. After one week, that's the same wound. After two weeks, you can see a lot of epithelial bridging, um, especially in the central aspect. Um, she's got, again, those, those cracks that go underneath the MPJ and underneath the IPJ. Uh, so I've told her, I mean, if you walk, you're just, every step you take, you're gonna be opening, opening, opening. So she's off that foot, and four weeks later, we're closed. Um, and uh, she's had no recurrence there and I think she sold her ceramic heater on Kijiji. <laughs> this is another patient, uh, very, very uh, severe diabetes, end stage renal disease. Um, we healed ulcers. You can see a little bit of a scabby, dry area on the lateral aspect of her heel. She had bilateral heel ulcers. Um, I worked with uh, one of Christine's old fellows, um, Dr. Paul Cantle, and we did some revascularization work with him. Uh, and then we used back to close these up and we got quite large, like three centimeter, two bone heel wounds closed on the lateral aspect. And just when we thought that we were done, she came in with a deep necrotic wound on the heel. And this is post debridement. I don't have the original um, appearance of the wound. You can just see the depth of this wound. It's, it's fairly healthy, it's not infected, but it's a deep uh, geographic wound in a pretty difficult spot at the posterior aspect of the heel. Um, I debrided with, with care, but confidence, knowing that we'd already healed her once here so that, that I could do a little bit, um, and we applied Prisma. Um, what you see next door there is the one-week photograph. Um, that granulation tissue is perked right up, um, now you have a surface which those epithelial cells can just start gliding across. Um, and uh, we got that one healed too. A long haul for her though. Here's a surgical wound post amputation of a hallux. Um, performed in the community. The patient had an open wound uh, for over a year before he saw me. Um, unfortunately, this gentleman is a long term smoker. He's got diabetes, he's got an above knee amputation on the other side. So being completely non-weight bearing is just not possible for him. He does need this foot to transfer. And that's why it's so important to keep it for him. If he loses this, his ability just to perform a transfer becomes just diminished. So his quality of life, while already poor, will become much worse. Um, so very little wound uh, over time, or change in the wound over a year. With Promogram Prisma, weekly debridements, that is it four weeks later. So some pretty dramatic closure there. The next thing I wanted to talk about is another bit of technology that we're using. I'm sure that you're all aware of VAC therapy. I've been using it since um, the late 90s. Um, and uh, we've been pretty active with it in Calgary, Alberta. Negative pressure wound th therapy is, is an adjunct to wound healing that's well, we all know enough about it, I won't go too much into it. But we now have a new um, a tool, a new, a new weapon in the arsenal. And this is the SNAP. 
Um, it is a mechanical, spring-driven device capable of maintaining that negative 125 millimeters of mercury continuous pressure with a small canister. Uh, this canister can be strapped to a leg or an arm, uh, depending on where you want to put it, where the wound is. Um, and it is primarily for, for minimally draining wounds, maybe 180 cc's per week, where you don't have to change the canister all that often. Um, it's for smaller wounds. Um, the dressing sizes are 10 centimeters uh, by 10 centimeters, 15 by 15, and then they have another offloading bridge dressing. Um, we are linking some of these together for larger wounds and finding good success with that as well. The dressing is not the drape that you're familiar with, but it's a hydrocolloid dressing. It helps to maintain that seal. It really sticks to this skin that's usually a poor quality. Uh, we often see rough, dry, scaly, um, you know, that skin of chronic stasis. Uh, very hard sometimes to get that back drape to stick to, but I find that the hydrocolloid actually sticks better with time. It's almost self-sealing. I'll have patients put this on and, and initially they have to charge that pump every few minutes and then you just watch it need to be charged a little less and a little less and after about an hour they're hardly charging the pump at all um, and they almost go to a twice a day type of charging system. Um, it's very easy, they just push a plunger and it's done. Um, as you know from a vac, if it's leaking when you put it on it doesn't ever get any better. It just gets worse. Uh, and the fact that this seems to almost repair itself has really been a, um, well, I like that. I get less calls. Uh, very important thing. If, if it's sealed, the therapy is working. It comes with a little hydrocolloid ring as well, the snap secure ring. Uh, this is just malleable hydrocolloid. For me, I put this around wounds or I'll tuck it in between toes to help with the seal. Those toe fissures often are an area of, of leaks and, and this just helps to seal that up. So it comes with the dressing and it's very handy to have. Um, so you don't have to go searching for all these things. It comes together in the package. Again, helps to secure this to that dry skin, the cracks and the fissures that you often see. So I've got a couple case studies with SNAP. First patient is a 57 year old male, diabetes, end stage renal disease, hypothyroid, hypertension, you know, the usual. Um, he had gangrene of his hallux. He had a Amp, um, amputation of the hallux after an angioplasty was performed. There was nothing that we could do to save the toe. Um, and post hallux amputation, first TMA excision, he had failure to heal. Uh, he had wound care for three months and somehow found his way uh, from one of my colleagues to my clinic. This was him at initial presentation. You know, it's clean, but it doesn't really look good. It's kind of a pale pink. It's kind of meh. The, the thing that concerned me most was this sinus that you see, uh, which actually went 1.4 centimeters, not to bone, but very near to the transmetatarsal, first metatarsal that was amputated. Um, so he had been revascularized. He was as optimal as we could make him. Uh, so we got to work and I did a little bit of debridement here and put on the snap dressing kit. And then I advised him again, strict non-weight bearing. Um, the patient's putting weight on this wound. You probably noticed the little fissure at the bottom there. That's gonna be the hardest part to heal of this wound in my estimation, and it's just not gonna heal if the patient is walking on it. So we started, we got him in a wheelchair. Uh, this is one week later. Uh, robust, healthy pink granulation tissue, and the sinus is nearly closed. At week two, the sinus is closed. That wound is ready for a skin graft. Unfortunately, my plastics guy um, that I talked to said, yeah, I'll get him in, but it took him three weeks to get him in, so there was a, a significant delay. Um, that didn't cause any problems, but it just delayed the timeline to closure. So here you can see we put on a split thickness skin graft. You've got a non-adherent dressing over top. You can see staples. All these things are a little bit difficult with the standard back drape. Um, with the secure ring around here, we've got a nice little border. The hydrocolloid dressing just adheres down to that. We put this snap on for seven days, and that is off-label utilization. 
I gotta make sure I get that out there, but we wanted to see if the snap would work as well as VAC does for slit, slit thickness skin grafts. Typically we're leaving those on for a good seven days. You don't want to do anything that disrupts that skin graft while it's an oscillating and taking. If you start changing dressings at day three, you lose your graft. Um, so we said we're gonna try this and we're gonna leave it on for a week. Um, so that is what we did. At six weeks or one week after applying the graft, this is what we've got. Full take of the graft, a little bit of maceration around there, um, but uh, the wound itself is healthy and looking good. Seven weeks, we're dealing with a little bit of, of graft to skin take right at the distal aspect of the wound, but we eventually coaxed that to close and he's fully healed. Um, the whole process took about two and a half months for him, so he moved along pretty rapidly. Next patient's a 59 year old male, again uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, lots of tobacco, gangrene, gas in the tissues, so he had a four foot amputation. Angioplasty was performed as well and uh, he presented three weeks post-op with this. Not much to like about this wound except it's not infected, but you have not really good tissues, you've got retraction, you've got periincisional eschar and necrosis. So. I talked to him about revising the transmetatarsal amputation and going back a little further or trying some snap and, and maybe get this to skin graft. So we put on the snap with, a bit, uh, with the bridge dressing. Here you can see that hydrocolloid dressing up close. Week one and week two on the right, you can see increased granulation. Uh, we're getting that fat to convert to nice pink healthy granular tissue. Uh, we're not losing any more tissue. We've got a little bit of maceration, but that's pretty mild. A day without any, you know, dry dressing will clear that right up. Week four, um, you can see that the skin has come up uh, nicely. The, the skin edges are moving in, so he's actually healing that wound a little bit. Um, and everything that used to be fat and fibrous is pretty much converted to granular tissue. We put a split thickness skin graft on it at that day. At week five, again, we left it on for seven days. Um, at week five, uh, you've got full take of that graft. Again, a little bit of maceration, but he's gone on to heal completely. Um, and he stay, uh, stayed healed to date. I just saw him the other day. So doing very well with that. Uh, finally, quality of life. As you know, with the vac dressings, people are carting around uh, two and a half pounds of machine. Uh, the snap kit weighs 2.2 ounces. Um, they don't have to be plugged in all the time. They've got much more freedom of movement. It can hide under the clothes so you can have this thing attached to your calf and nobody knows it's there. And you're not waking up with a machine beeping or humming away all the time. So patients appreciate a little bit more sleep. Um, and in the right wound, I'm finding this to be an extremely effective uh, treatment. Um, there are obviously some wounds that are going to require a vac. We've had some wounds that just drain too much and they overwhelm this system. But if you've got the right wound, um, this is a, a very nice uh, way to go. And that's what I have for you today. <laughs>